Hi guys, Al Andrew here. Thanks so much for taking the time to participate in this Leap Into Live Streaming Bootcamp brought to you by Ecamm Live and our friends at Light Camera Live. It's such a privilege to be here with you today and I trust that all this information is easy to understand and practical to use. Today's session is called Creating Engaging Live Sports Broadcasts Using Ecamm Live. Now, if you're here already, you probably have a really good inclination that what we do in the sports world is very different to our other friends online. All the equipment is the same, and how they're connected and how they work together is absolutely crucial to having any successful live broadcast. So we've got a lot to cover, let's get straight into it. 150 to go and Melangani is holding on, Alfonso on his shoulder, Zolani's not out of it either, it's anybody's race, can anyone catch Melangani? Oh, maybe somebody can, is that our cameraman? He's matching in stride for stride, he's run the whole race with that camera on his shoulder. So, what are we actually trying to achieve when we decide to stream sport? It's more than just following a ball or capturing a good result. It's all about that experience. We want our viewers to feel a part of the event, as if they were there themselves. They need to see it, hear it, and feel exactly what's going on. They need to be constantly engaged and entertained for each second of the match. It's our job to make this happen. Can you imagine watching a sports event without any information on the screen? No clock counting down, no excited commentator going off on the mic. And what about that halftime entertainment? All these elements are used to build up the excitement and enhance that experience we need to create for our audience. This is easier said than done, I know but it is achievable to live stream any sport event with just a few simple tools, many of which are already built into Ecamm. Let's see how we can make this work. All right guys, let's go straight into it. Let's start breaking down all the tools we need in their simplest form to lay out a foundation so you can understand it. This may appear to be profoundly simple and you probably already have a really good idea of what is required, but let's just run through this list quickly, okay? So I've decided to call this the live streaming signal path. Okay, so what's the first thing we need? We need a video input. So obviously that is a camera, right? Very simple. Now, what we see is only 50% of what we're doing here. We also have to hear what we're doing. So, a mic, all right? Something that will become our audio input, okay? I want you to always think of these two things as two separate entities, and they're both as important as each other, all right? So, we've got these two inputs, and they're all gonna be sent into the Mac, which is housing Ecamm. All right, so you've got your camera going in and you've also got your audio going into your Mac. Then Ecamm will send that to the internet via a modem, all right? And those get sent to the CDNs or what's commonly known now as content distribution networks. So that's your YouTube, your Twitch, and of course your Facebook. When we look at all four of these elements like this, it simply allows us to start building a clear concept and a signal path of that workflow, all right? You have to know what your inputs and outputs are doing. Unlike working in a studio or a fixed home setup, right? In the sports broadcast world, we're often setting up days before, sometimes even hours before. So there is a massive margin for error. Things don't get plugged in, things forget to be charged. This happens so easily and it can be detrimental so you have to understand what your ins inputs are doing and what your outputs are doing. So guys, please pay attention to signal path. It's very, very important. So if you do have a technical challenge on site, you need to remember it, what everything is and just break it down into its simplest form and then work from there. Of course, as we start building this rig and as we start building this signal path into a more complicated uh, environment to work in, you will obviously 
need to think of each section in a simpler form. So your audio will need to be broken down into simpler parts and so will your video. And there are lots of things in sport which we can do which can get very confusing. So I hope that we just starting like this is just easing you into the way I want you to start thinking about streaming. And you can take this and use it in any form of streaming or any kind of audio work or video work. So let's move on. So you're wanting to cover a sports event. There are so many ways to do this effectively. It's important to identify what your audience is expecting. Is it just a simple club match on a weekend or an international event to be broadcast online? Trust me, I had to develop quickly from just recording a couple of matches and teaching myself how to edit to being thrown on a plane to South Korea to cover an entire event. So never think what you do won't be noticed. Just understand what you need and how you're going to use it. The best advice I was ever given by a producer in South Africa, Mr. Neil Campbell was, use what you've got Al, just use what you've got. And I've based everything I do these days on exactly that. So when we look at cameras, it's really easy to get blinded by all the new tech and toys and we get thrown in with 4K and 8K and all this thing. Trust me, I love gear, but I haven't even reached the cap of any of the equipment I bought three years ago. So it's always good to keep in mind, use what you've got. So what are the camera essentials for sports? This session is assuming we only have a single camera. It's important to be able to have a good usable first camera. Here are my minimum requirements, what I would look for if I was buying a new camera or looking to pick up a good second hand one. Does it have a good zoom lens? Some cameras you can detach a lens, some come with it built in. Am I able to really get into the action of the match? Know the limitations of the lens that you're getting involved with because you never know where you're allowed to film from. You don't always have the luxury of going on the side of the field. Sometimes you get told to go right at the back there mate, out of the way. But either way, you've got to know that the camera you're using is able to bring the action to the screen for your audience. A good lens control system. Um, they're fairly affordable and uh, you just need to get a little lens remote. LANC is the protocol which is used to control the lens, pulling in and pulling out, even controlling the focus. These are things that you need to look at very carefully. Always have a camera that has two SD cards for recording. Trust me, one day your stream is going to fall over and the whistle's going to go and the game has started. All you're going to be relying on are those two little SD cards. You're going to put a quick edit together at the end of the, of the match and you're going to broadcast it straight to Facebook straight afterwards. It happens. I do it all the time. Things go wrong, but you've got to have that backup in place. And knowing that your camera has enough space to record anything that's going on is very important. Make sure you have XLR audio inputs. Give yourself the best audio options you can. Not only just to attach a good quality mic to your camera, you'll be surprised what else you can do when you know you've got good solid professional audio inputs attached to your camera. Also, make sure your camera has an excellent video output. This is what essentially is going to be fed out to the computer into Ecamm. So you want to be able to push out an HDMI signal or an SDI signal and get that to your Mac in a good high quality. So make sure that the camera can output 720, 1080p, and maybe later as bandwidth becomes more available, we'll be looking at 4K, but that won't be happening for many years. There's so many options when deciding what camera to use, but I would certainly encourage you to look at the ENG style camera, which is the news gathering type camera. Um, a lot of these cameras have the standard features that we've just discussed, and uh, they make such solid cameras and they're durable, and they're used to be moved around, and they're used to delivering professional quality product. So Panasonic, JVC, Sony, these are all great cameras. And they also offer lots of tactile switches on the side, which are very good for making quick adjustments when you're trying to film a match. You don't have time to scroll through a little LCD menu for menu for menu just to make one quick small adjustment, which with an ENG style camera can just be done quickly with a flick of a switch. So really investigate what these cameras are offering you.
As mentioned many times already, audio is what makes up 50% of your broadcast. With poor or no sound, your visual is simply not believable. So it is very important that you understand how your audio is put together. Did you know that there are different types of sound that we can capture for our streams? We need the sound effects. That's the audio source which is coming from the field. Boehm on defence, great work there. Steals it away. Tries to get it on nice work. Gets around the plate from Brazil. Oh, Pablo was there in front of the cage. What's the referee going to say? The sounds of the players talking, the ball being hit around, the sound of the coach screaming from the sidelines. All these elements are what make your stream believable to the audience. We also need the ambient sound. That would be the crowd cheering and clapping for their team. These are powerful sound sources to immerse into your broadcast. If you are fortunate enough to have a commentator working with you, that is a very powerful sound source asset to have. Nothing beats a commentator building up the intensity and informing your audience of exactly what's going on. I love watching the comments as they stream through as all the audience is having a different point of view to what the commentator is saying about the game. This is all a very powerful tool to build up this experience we're creating online. When mixed together, these sound sources work extremely well in your broadcast. So how do we capture these sound sources effectively? It's all about using the right mic for the job. For field and crowd effects, a good pair of shotgun mics is really all you need. Make sure they're set up in a good XY position in order for you to capture a good, even range of sound. Simply put, shotgun mics are designed to pick up the audio which is sitting right in front of them. They have a very narrow and direct pickup pattern. Rode and Sennheiser make some excellent shotgun mics. Take a good careful look at everything they have to offer and find the right tool for your application. For starting out, I would look at a pair of Rode NTG1s. For a commentator, I would simply use a good quality dynamic microphone. They tend to be a bit more forgiving. Just be sure you can't hear the hand noise when they're using it. There's nothing more frustrating than unwanted sound coming through your mics on your broadcast. Also, go hardwired. Wireless is a great option for a roaming camera or interviews, but the last thing you want to be concerned about is battery powers and managing mics which are wireless. It's just something you can do without, so go hardwired straight into the console. Just to add on mics, there are a lot of mics out there to choose from. Each have their pros and cons. It's important to know the limitations of each mic and understand what you are looking for and how you plan to use it. I still use my first original shotgun mic. Your requirements may change over time, but you need to be able to look inside your toolbox and say, what have I got now? How am I going to get this job done now? It's not about looking online and finding the next thing to buy. Please, know what you're buying before you get going. Coming back to our mix, remember to monitor your audio, use a pair of headphones to check what sound the mics are actually picking up. How does it sound on Facebook and YouTube? Use your phone, do a test before the match starts and just have a listen to what your end user is actually hearing. These tests are so simple, yet they are so effective. Sometimes you might not even realize that a mic is not on. Just check on your phone. So assuming we only have one camera here and that has two audio XLR inputs, but now I have three mics. Al, how am I gonna manage this? The solution is pretty simple and we're gonna start introducing some extra equipment into this signal flow so things are going to start getting a little bit more complicated but it's a good workaround. You're going to get yourself a mixing console or a little audio recorder or sound interface which can accept three mics so you're going to put all your mics into the mixing console or audio recorder you're going to mix them in and get a nice audio level using your gains and using your master faders on your console or recorder you want to have a good hot signal coming from your mics this is the time where you need to be able to hear what is going on so from the mixing console or recorder we're going to take the output of that and we're going to feed that into the two XLR inputs of our camera. You're going to make the camera inputs a line input, a line plus four. They're not going to be mics anymore, they're going to be a line input. Now, you're probably thinking, Al, 
why aren't we just sending the sound straight to Ecamm? We want to minimize how much delay we have between our picture and our audio. And the best workaround for this actually is to make sure that the picture and the sound go to Ecamm at the same time. Yes, I know in preferences we can actually adjust the delay in Ecamm, but that should be used for micro adjustments. You really shouldn't be allowing Ecamm to be doing some heavy lifting if you're trying to match picture and sound for a 30 minute broadcast. So if you think about it, you actually have three areas where you need to balance the sound. We have the output of the recorder, we have the output of the camera, and then we have the output that's coming into Ecamm. So all these areas need to be balanced out. So if you have a good strong signal coming from your mics where the gain is really healthy and you're getting a good strong signal, just make sure you bring down the master of the recorder down a bit so that it's not gonna overload the next two stages. So in layman's terms, just make sure it's not going out of the yellow, just bring it so it's just tickling the yellow on your recorder, all right, about minus 20 is healthy. And you want it to stay at about minus 15 coming out of the camera, and then you just want to be able to monitor what's happening on Ecamm. Maybe you can just do a small boost or cut using the Ecamm volume input, and that way you're getting that balance. So just remember, good strong gain from the mics, then bring it down on the master recorder and then just balance those other two outputs. So, picture and audio are feeding Ecamm beautifully and we're ready to go live. This is now where it all starts getting just a little bit geeky. Vital factor in your setup is your modem and your internet supply. You need to check your internet speed. The best way to do this is to use simply speedtest.com. Understanding the important numbers is easy. All you have to worry about is your upload speed. In sport, it's important that our pipe is big enough so that our stream runs smoothly. This is quite important for us in sport because we tend to run at high frame rates and we also have a lot of movement. So our bandwidth is very important. Here are some numbers for you to look at. For Facebook Live, the maximum resolution is 720p at 30 frames. So you're probably looking at an upload speed of 5.7 megabytes per second. For YouTube, it's a little bit different. 720p at 60 frames, you need between 2.9 megabits and 7.4. So you wanna be probably hitting about eight. 1080p at 30 frames, you need between 3.8 and 7.4. 1080p at 60 frames per second, your speed needs to be between 5.6 and 11 megabits per second. It's pretty difficult, but if you can manage to get a steady upload speed, everything should run smoothly. That's why my advice is always aim for a good 720 by 50 or 60 frames per second. This will create an easy to manage stream and you will also get a decent picture. So remember, 720p is still HD high definition, so it is a very acceptable format to be watching. Your audience is probably watching on an iPad or a phone, so the difference between a 1080 picture and a 720 picture on a phone or a tablet, it's marginal. It's very difficult to actually see the difference. Let's look at some graphics. Overlays, titles, scoreboards, comments, tickers are all types of graphics which deliver relevant information or enhance the interaction of our broadcasts. You need to choose selectively how you plan to use them. Being organized and prepared in advance is the key to having effective graphics. Ecamm Live does an excellent job of managing graphics, easily being able to drag and drop, turn on and off, the access from the desktop is just so handy, especially in a sports broadcast when time is everything. So what kind of overlays do we have? Let's just take a look at a few so at least you know what they are. Titles. These are generally taking up the entire screen and making a huge announcement, usually in an introduction to a match or a tournament. Lower thirds, you've seen these before all the time. They're used normally in an interview situation where you have the name of somebody 
And for us in sports, it would be telling them, is the player the captain? Is the player a goalkeeper? Is it perhaps the coach? That kind of information is vital when you're delivering a lower third. Bugs, normally these are little icons which would be represented by the brand, sponsor of the event. They generally sit in the corners of the uh, screen. Don't make them too big and keep their colors simple. Don't let them be a distraction during the match. Stingers, these are the graphics with animation which are used as a transition. Normally, extra hardware sitting on the outside of Ecamm is required to get these to go. You would normally see these in between replays. You'd see the brand of the team or the brand of the event. Maybe even the brand of the production company, Tickers. We've all seen these in the news on TV a lot. Running text at the bottom of the screen displaying the latest news. In sport, I like to use these to give the results of the day. These tickers create enormous relevance to the event and it allows your audience to feel more involved with what's been happening during the day. In sports, other graphics that we would need are obviously scorecards, clocks, maybe even penalty information, player names. All these things need to be generated over the match and they are actually quite difficult to manage. There are products out there which offer you really good looking and professional results. If you're in the US, you might actually already have a lot of databases out there which are available for you to tap into online and your scores can be automatically generated as an overlay. Do your investigation online. I was very jealous for not living in America when I saw all the options out there for colleges and schools streaming their matches. I personally use a product by a company called New Blue Effects. They have a live sports package which is ideal for the independent, on-the-go broadcaster. It all works inside my computer. I'm able to patch it directly into Ecamm via an NDI input. And we're gonna take a closer look at this and show you how it works. Not only does it manage my scorecards, but I can also do titles, lower thirds, bugs, tickers. Let's take a closer look at New Blue Effects Sports Live. Okay, so this is new blue effects when you open the program this is what you see if you buy the sports package here on the left you will see it just sitting there and you can just double click all right and then you've got lots of different options of all the different kinds of sports scoreboards that you can use okay so what you would do is you would simply select this type of scorecard that you would like. This is a nice simple one. So let's just drag that over and put it in. On the right, you'll see all the attributes that you're able to change. So while it's still loading, you can see that this graphics is loading. You just put the name there. So let's just say this is well, Melbourne. And immediately you will see over here that it's loading and there it's changed to Melbourne. And uh, we're going to call this one more Dialic. Okay, so those are the two teams which are going to be playing today. Each team has its own uh, badge, right? So you can actually click on that icon over there and you'd be able to go and find... There we go, that'll work. All right. Boom, and that's changed. You can actually change the size. So you can set to fill, set to fit, and also set to conform see it stretches it a bit so I always just leave it to set to fill it's pretty straightforward uh, we better just change that one too just so you can see it and there's the new Mordialic badge boom see now my graphics there set to fit see that badge was a bit different in size so you do use these tools um, you'll see there one is set to fill and one is set to fit so you do tend to uh, just toggle them sometimes your artwork doesn't match this is nice you can change the colors if you wanted to just change that to green now boom and it's changed so very easy not difficult to do if you've got a artistic mind you you're pretty straightforward you can do whatever you want all right so we've set that up nicely that's our scorecard. That's a very basic introduction to how you can set it up. Now what's nice is, you see the little finger there, you can actually change the size of it too. So it's just a question of dragging and dropping. So we haven't even started using this thing yet and it's already starting to look like a proper scoreboard, right? Um, while that's loading, let me show you 
um, how you control the scoreboard. You have a way of inputting your information and you have to tell in the attributes exactly what type of scoreboard you are planning to use. So it's definitely going to be a sports, right? And you're going to be using a scoreboard tool which is built into a new BlueFX. And I'm using the hockey one because that's the easiest one for me. It's just a, a goal up and down. So you've obviously got all these different sports which you could use because the actual um, scoreboard tool, which is dedicated to hockey, will be very relevant, the, the numbers and the inputs. Um, but here you have all the controls. Now, I've never used all these controls for everything. But what's really cool about this, you can send this to an iPad. If you've got an iPad on the same network as you, you can actually control this via an iPad, um, which is handy. So you can have somebody else doing this. So if you wanted this to go live, now this is not connected to Ecamm yet, right? But you'd basically just switch it on and this screen on the right hand side is now, when we've connected New Blue to Ecamm, this will obviously appear on Ecamm. Now that we have our scorecard set up, we need to tell New Blue Effects where to send this uh, signal. Where do we want this scorecard to go? We have this menu here, Video Out. Click on it, and we're going to send it via an NDI signal. If you want to send it via HDMI, you can do that too, and you'll need to green screen it out, so you can key it out. That can be done. All right but we're using NDI because that is the best and most reliable way to do it in Ecamm. So I've now sent that via an NDI output to Ecamm. Let's see how Ecamm can see this and we can use it. I'm going to fire it up. Now let's see how Ecamm can use this. Okay, so here we are now, we're looking at Ecamm as you would see it as a user, okay? And I'm gonna to go to camera, and I'm gonna see there, now I have three things which uh, I can use as an input. I've got the uh, FaceTime camera, uh, I've got my Logitech camera, which I'm recording this session with, and then also we've got the new Blue Title Alive. That's the whole program we've been looking at. Now remember, in new Blue Effects, I've already fired this thing up and it's ready to broadcast. So, Let's just switch it on and let's tell Ecamm that we want it to show this thing. Bang! And there's that scorecard we made earlier. Now, I'm not going to show you the controls for the new blue effect, but that was that little arrow. If I just unclick it, it's gone, right? And there it is again. So it's perfectly animated. With those controls that you saw, you can change the score, you can get the clock to go, go, and everything works really well. So it's a very effective and very usable format. You can get really carried away with this thing. And um, I use it in its absolute basic form, but it's very powerful. What I find would be very handy is if you have um, the sportscast um, scoreboards which are available in America, you can actually just connect this thing up and you don't even have to uh, you don't even have to control it using this uh, control system. You just let the person who's controlling it in the match and it will just get sent to you. Um, it's a very powerful package. I strongly advise it if it's sport is something that you are involved in and uh, I think it's worth your while. Now, don't forget, we also have a sports package available to somebody uh, who's involved with this boot camp. So keep your eyes peeled for a way that you can get your hands on that free package, which is worth $449 US. So certainly worth your while. All right, guys, let's just take a look at how I like to organize things for Ecamm um, before we broadcast. This is all about managing your overlays and looking at your content. Make sure you always have a folder on your desktop. Uh, where you can locate all your assets in a very organized fashion. So here I am. So here we have um, everything that I need at the drop of a hat basically and it's organized, right? So I always have each event that I would be working on in its own folder and um, 
other assets which just need to be there all the time. Um, there are a couple of things here which shouldn't be there, but um, let's just have a look and see what I've got going on here. This is my new blue effects folder. So in new blue effects, you can save projects. So uh, when I was in Barcelona last year for an international event, I had all the countries we were playing um, ready to go for the new blue uh, scorecards that I was using. Okay, so I'm able to do that. So that's available for me straight away. So I like to have that immediately. You don't want to be going through the finder to find stuff when you're doing sport. Um, I have a series of badges and things which I use all the time, um, which I use a lot. Let's just pretend we're going to set up for a match. And on the outset, I'm just going to say I don't use scenes. Uh, for this kind of format. For sport, I just do not use scenes. I just, if I need something, I need to see it and I need to click on it. So that's the that's the method we're using here today. So it's probably gonna be pretty straightforward for you. So I have a system in place where I know the videos I need. So I know I'm gonna need 30 second timeouts. And for some reason, I'm gonna pause it. And then I know I'm gonna need one minute. I'm out and I've got a few different ones there I've got I always do a lot of pre-recorded stuff and I have people talking or advertising the brands that we're representing okay and then I also know I'm going to need a half time right so that's already organized and good to go open all right all good so that would be my three videos all good to go all there ready ready to fire off and i'd probably also have an introduction uh, which i would also just do there so then also i know that i'm going to be having a match between who is our team we said we were going to play uh melbourne versus mordialic right so some information for people watching the match so we know a red card and a blue card for both teams we've got melbourne here red card melbourne blue card melbourne all right so these are all things that i've made in final cut i've used a pro res 4444 file uh, which is a transparent file and uh, Ecamm is able to use those okay so they look great they work well sometimes I just find it easier to make them in Final Cut than if you don't have Final Cut and New Blue is the only option you have well use what you've got right so that's that and then I need to have also I need to have my little sponsor logo in the back there. So that's also a 4444 file, ProRes, uh, which I made in Final Cut with some transitions. I've got just my sponsors and my events there. So we've got Roller Hockey Australia and Jost and stuff. And what's nice about Ecamm is I can loop that. So I don't even have to worry about that bug anymore. It's just up there and it's working. So what have we got? We've got our our blue cards and our red cards for each team and I got my movies and I got my scorecard got our scoreboard ready to roll so in theory we're ready to stream I've got everything I need and it's all come from this one folder on my desktop and what's nice is once you've set up Ecamm right and you are all good to go you can just set things up neatly. Um, I do like to have the comments. I show those out there. And that's pretty much how I would roll. Um, I sometimes have an extra, um, I have an extra monitor set up so I can control new blue. Um, I've started working with a crew so I don't actually work the camera anymore. So I actually control the entire production now. Um, so I'm nursing Ecamm 100%, I'm doing replays and I'm doing all the online graphics. So I have an extra monitor where I control the scores and the, the clock and um, that is my workspace. It's really not difficult to manage but uh, 
keep it neat, keep it simple. I think that's very powerful. This is Hyper Slow, designed by a company called Life Skills. They do a lot of um, dedicated iOS apps which can run on your iPhone or your iPad, predominantly to control Blackmagic hardware. So, Hyper Slow is a replay system which I've been using for about three years. I think the initial investment was well worth it, and um, this app continuously developing. So, it's really exciting to see where it's gone. So. I'm just going to demonstrate it in its basic form so that you can actually get an idea how to use it and maybe it's potentially something you can look at. Certainly a much more cost-effective way of doing replays for a stream. Let's just run through it. It's a very deep app, so you've got to really know your chops. Not that I do, but I, it works for me. I'm using what i got, right? So let me just give you a quick run through of what it actually looks like and how it how easy it is to actually just get a replay of one camera. The uh, iPad is connected to its own individual network. Uh, I've got it hardwired to a network. And from there, it's connected to various outboard gear. So each camera has its own dedicated recorder, hard disk recorder, which has the, the hard disk recorder or the Blackmagic Hyperdeck has the ability to play slowly or quicker, and it works with time code. So basically what HyperSlow is doing is generating markers using time code, and then if you wish to go back to a particular marker or an event, the app will say, right, it needs to go to this point marked with this time code, and the HyperDeck will say, right, I need to go to that event, and it finds it, and then you switch over to the hypertech output on your switcher or your ATEM and you are now playing back the replay from the marking point. That's it really in very layman's terms. You have the ability to connect up to four hyperdecks, so ideally four cameras if you wish. A lot of the other options out there are a lot more expensive. You are able to play your play your replays at different speeds. You can slow it down or speed it up. Hit increments here. This is the list of the events which you are marking as you're shooting and I'll show you how that works shortly. You're able then to label your different types of markers. So as you can see here, I've got shots, goals, and then if I have a team, uh, obviously Australia goal is green and then the other team is yellow. Uh, you've got your fouls, your penalties, and then if there's an official event like a, like a referee discrepancy, that's always handy to have. Um, so you can actually customize these buttons or these event triggers. There you have your time code. So that's got to be running. That's got to match whatever you're feeding it. Uh, so your cameras, so I'm running one camera right now, and then once we start playing, that time code will run, play, stop, you can record it, you can disconnect. Once you have a marker, you are able to either pre-program how far back it goes from the event. So obviously if there's a goal, you want to see what happens before the goal. So do you want to see it at five seconds before or three seconds? You can preset that. I always have it at five seconds. Or you can manually go to event and then trigger whatever event, maybe it's just two seconds. Uh, and you can also ramp the speed over here, which is kind of cool. You can speed something up forward or speed it backwards. I'll be able to show you that later. Stop record, stop reverse. This basically, if you have an event and then you wish to go to that event straight away, that's where the preset would kick in. You're also able to um, do a replay with two separate angles um, that can be done. So if you have three cameras and an event only happens on camera one and two, and you have that set up, you are able to then get two angles on one replay. So the app is capable of doing that. So let me just show you very roughly. Let's go to the event list, right? I want to clear all those events, right? I'm going to clear it. I'm going to go back. 
Now I have no vents. Okay, so it's all clear and it's all ready to go. So I'm cheating a bit here. I'm playing some pre-recorded footage on my TV and then I'm going to show you how to use the app. All right, so I'm, it's a workaround, but it's, it's working. So these are the HyperDeck recorders, which are connected to the ATEM over here. Now I'm gonna discuss a bit more on advanced setups, but this essentially is the outboard gear that I'm using to connect HyperSlow to this, and then it gets all sent to Ecamm, all right? So hopefully you guys will just have a little idea of what's going on, and uh, I'm monitoring it over here. Okay, so we're going to start. We're going to start recording. So now that's the time code that's coming from the camera. All right. And the time code on the hyperdeck is matching. So they're all synced. Comes into the shots and boom, and then back to the action. Push record on the hyper slow, so it is a bit <coughs> shot. Takes a shot. I'm gonna go back to that, switch over. I want to play it at 50%. Passes the ball and he takes the shot. And we go back to the action, press record. Now, this works really well if you have somebody else doing it for you. Another shot, go back, 50%. So once you start getting into a rhythm, you really start understanding how it works. And then back to the action. Looks like something else happened on this pre-recording, but that's fine. All right, so that's how you would do it. So let's try, let's wait for an event. Shot, go back 50%, show you that shot. All right, here you go, there's Max, he takes a shot, he winds up. Let's just say, oh, let's just take a look at that again. And you can actually go backwards a bit. You can see what I'm doing here. I'm just dragging it. And it's very, very smooth. I mean, and then you let go. And then you can control the speed. Let's just see that action again at 25% slow. You can stop it. It's very easy to do. Go back. So, for the sake of a network and a little bit of outboard gear, it's a very, very effective program. I hope this has demonstrated it enough for you. Now, what I do like about this app is, is that you can actually go into an area here where you can, it's what they call simulation mode, and you can actually train yourself so you don't actually need to have anything connected to the iPad and you can actually just go back and you can actually now start training and working on the app which is really good so it's very important to be able to practice this and uh, find your way around it. It's very intuitive and I think if you've come to this point of uh, growth in your productions I think you would grow into the app just like I am. Um, I've been using it to run one camera for replays uh, for about 
two and a half years now. But um, I do have three cameras when I shoot. So I normally have a camera above each goal for roller hockey. And then I have one camera on a tripod in the middle, which is the shot you're seeing now. So I only have the main camera set up for uh, set up for replays, but I'm and the, at the moment I am busy just setting up a proper three camera replay system, so I could have two angles of slow motion on each goal end, so the center camera and whatever camera is above the goals. Okay, hope this helps. Let's take a look at some more interesting outboard gear, which you guys might be uh, curious about. So let's just go straight to it. So this is predominantly my rig. This is what I use to stream sports. I tend to put it all in a nice little flight case, quite a bit of gear which I can travel around with. So to be ready to go at the drop of a hat is very important to me. So I have a Blackmagic ATEM switcher. So the best way to think about a ATEM switcher is it's a visual mixer. You have all your cameras going in and you are able to change the channels and change the, the input which goes to Ecamm. You can take eight cameras, four on an SDI input and then four on an HDMI. So I find that a bit limiting now that I've grown in terms of uh, I don't really like using HDMI based equipment for what I do, uh, but uh, it's what I've got right now. I've got my eyes on something else also in Blackmagic, but predominantly SDI. So it's something to think about if you are doing stuff at home and you want to have more switching check what your gear is already. If it's all HDMI, then maybe that's the route you need to go to. Um, I was in a position where I was growing with my cameras, so my requirements change very quickly. Uh, I find with sport, you need to be able to run cable at a long distance in some, in some cases, so SDI is generally the way to go for that kind of uh, workflow. But if you're working at home in a home studio, HDMI might be very, very suitable for what you're doing. Okay, so that's the ATEM. So I send my mix signal or my program output to my Ultra Studio HD. So this basically allows me to send the video signal from all the cameras to Ecamm via a Thunderbolt 3 output. Very powerful little device and I'm very pleased with this. Um, some, of, some of you guys might be using the mini recorders, which is basically the same thing as this. Uh, it's just a little more advanced. It has a few more audio outputs. I can I can also use this in the studio, which allows me to do a bit of uh, heavy lifting if I need to. So it's a very versatile device. Uh, not the best out there, but it's still good. So again, I just stress this. None of my gear is 4K capable. Um, so it's not really a requirement right now. So I'm still using 1080p 60. Uh, these guys over here are what we call Hyperdex. Um, they are dedicated um, hard disk recorders. This is what we use with Hyperslow. Um, they run just normal SSDs and they just record. I can use them for uh, the slow motion or I can use them for the um, recording a show. Sometimes I don't want Ecamm to do that recording. Uh, so I, I I work outside of Ecamm and I record it like that. So that's another option you have. But I predominantly use, so my reason for having these is to basically have a full replay system in place. So I've got two at the moment. I have one really good one, and then I have one which has got a, a ceiling of 720.50, which at the moment is a bit frustrating for me because I'm actually looking to be at a 1080p uh, setup. That's really where I'm heading. I want a solid setup at 1080p. I also have some monitors here which I put in a little flight case which allows me to see what's going on. So you may have seen something called a multi-view before. That's um, basically every camera that you, you're plugging in. You would see it over here. This can all be customized and then this is the program. So th basically this is what would be getting sent to Ecamm. And then I would add graphics and I run the show from Ecamm, which is really practical as we mentioned earlier. So 
A lot of the work gets done outside before it even gets to Ecamm. So that's why it's important to really understand your signal flow. This is another Blackmagic Hyperdeck. This is called the Hyperdeck Mini Studio. Uh, this one runs off SD cards. You don't have to go the big heavy rack route like this. You can also go with these small guys. They're pricey, but they're worth it. And they're very, um, very versatile. I use them for all kinds of things. So if you need a video recorder or a playback system, sometimes you can use these Hyperdecks for onboard graphics. Uh, you can use them for overlays. You can use them for all, all kinds of practical things. You can have a lot of pre-recorded material set up on one of these. I found the workflow of having pre-recorded stuff on the Hyperdex a bit tricky to manage. And at the time I was looking at finding a system to do it. And that's why I enjoy Ecamm so much because I can just queue up all those videos and have it ready to go. So again, you, there is hardware to do the job, but often Ecamm is able to do a lot of the things that you want to do. So don't underestimate just Ecamm, but don't rely only on Ecamm. That's also, it's like a fine balance. Uh, really just try and find out what works best and what works quickest, especially for sport. Uh, audio, as I mentioned before, is very important to me and uh, I tend to go with an audio recorder. This is a Sound Devices Mix Pre 6, which offers me six inputs of audio and I can push that into Ecamm via a USB cable. So and it works really well for me. 